Thank you. And we have some time for discussion. Perhaps because this isn't my field, I didn't really understand what was meant by the terms uh, recurrence and reciprocal interaction. Could you elaborate a little bit on exactly what those concepts mean? Yeah, the, the concept means that if you have a, a, a composite system uh, that consists of elements, of components, um, once these components are arranged in a way that they can interact with each other in a reciprocal way, so A interacts or can act on B, B can act on C, C can react on A, maybe B can also act back on C or on A, once you have such reciprocally coupled networks, uh, you get a completely different system property than when you just trans uh, transmit information, for example, uh, stepwise in a, in a hierarchical system uh, from bottom to top uh, without recurrency, without feedback. It, no, no, it's more than feedback. Um, we make the distinction between uh, re-entry, where you have the same information um, cycle again back to the first stage, to a lower level, then reprocess it, send it to a higher level, and within each level have horizontal exchange of information. In, 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 a, in a, yeah, I can't say more than, it's, it's a network of nodes that is reciprocally, they, that are reciprocally coupled. And that's a principle that is, has appeared late in evolution. Uh, the very early inventions or the early manifestations of this principle have been in the so-called central pattern generators. They are used to produce movement because such, such circuits can generate uh, patterns and the movement is a pattern. Uh, this strategy of, produce, of having these recurrent networks has been implemented in sensory systems only very late in evolution. Recurrent means um, if you, you go from A to, you couple A to B, and you couple B to A. Reci call it reciprocity. Yes. Uh, like Philips, I also have a question about the vocabulary in this context. What do you call linear or nonlinear? Because, I mean, neural networks, uh, simple as they are, they are nonlinear. I mean, there are these sigmoid functions and whatever. So when you say linear as opposed to nonlinear, what do you mean? Well, I should probably have said, um, for those recurrent systems, highly nonlinear. Because, of course, the deep learning networks, they have some nonlinearities because they are thresholding devices in the nodes. While these recurrent systems, they really are generative and they produce uh, highly nonlinear dynamics by themselves. Uh, you, they are not dependent on any input function. Um, they just entertain themselves actively and produce very nonlinear dynamics. Uh, most of them, at least in, in natural systems, they, they hoover close to criticality at the edge of chaos. Uh, this is where people think that the cerebral cortex, for example, is tuned in order to be able to explore as large a state space as possible. Okay, take this around. I don't know if I, it's a pertinent question, but uh, I think that you use more the philosophy than the mathematics to understand the, the brain and, and the social things because the principle of reciprocity is a very old philosophical principle. The analogy, the principle of analogy, is also a very old principle of, of the philosophy. And in this, is, I think that could be better the, the philosophy that the mathematics to understand, or, or both, but in the end. This, I, don't, I don't know if we can find the principle of reciprocity in, 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 in mathematics. 
Well, this is a, this is a severe problem in the analysis of these systems. Um, mathematics already has difficult, but, but Cedric may comment on this much more competently. Um, there's a famous three-body problem. If you have three um, elements that are dynamic, like pendula or so, coupled reciprocally, uh, you already have a big problem in, in analytically uh, describing such a, the dynamics of such a system or to predict its future trajectories. Now, in biological systems, we usually we have hundreds, thousands, and in the case of brain, probably millions of reciprocally coupled elements, which are self-active, are nonlinear elements in themselves. And you can imagine the, the mind-boggling complexity of the dynamics that results and the inability to treat those systems analytically because that would be, a, I don't know, a huge system of interdependent differential equations. Um, I think even supercomputers. And then the question is, why, why should you do that? Why should you try to analytically understand such a system? Um, so what we do usually is we, we simulate at a very pedestrian level, um, because it's impossible to implement all the details in computers. and um, since we cannot understand, and this is another interesting thing, I forgot to mention that on one of the slides, uh, our intuition, our cognition is not shaped to understand the dynamics of such high dimensional dynamic systems. We, we are not tuned to it. It had, not, had no survival value to adapt to these worlds. We have it in our head, but we don't need it to survive. So we have no cognition, no intuition for these processes, which makes it very difficult for us to understand the data that we get. Uh, imagine you get data from 200 nodes that correlate, time series that correlate with some behavior. You don't see anything. Our cognitive system is not able to detect any pattern in there. So all we can do is we can use machine learning techniques in order to find consistent patterns in what we cannot see, and then assume that this is what matters. So we have also severe epistemic problems in understanding such complex systems because our intuition isn't built to do it. I will, I will make a small uh, comment on what was just said. Uh, number of bodies or so on, number of uh, bodies is not a problem when there is some notion of independence. I mean, three-body problem, is, three bodies is a problem, but for uh, galactic dynamics, one billion bodies would not be a problem because there is some notion of uh, independence between them. On the other hand, uh, of course, in neural processes as well in economical processes, there is strong dependence and high correlation from uh, uh, actor to actor. And then we are at a loss and, uh, and then there is no, no renal recipe to reduce the face space to something decent or whatever. So we are uh, correlations, large and uh, large scale correlations, which also appear in phase transitions. There are a nightmare. Yeah. Perhaps, perhaps I can um, shed some light on this. I'm new in this area. If, if you look at the architect. If you look at the architecture of neurons, you could have one neuron interfacing with uh, switching, inputting with as much as 10,000 other neurons, which go to another set of neurons. But they also come back to the first neurons. So in these interactions, the number of connections and possibilities actually grow combinatorially. And because they're growing combinatorially, there's this new emergent complexity that we really don't have a clue as to what's going on. So it's not a simple feedback system in the sense of, a, a, of one single closed loop because you're going combinatorially increasing. In the artificial neural nets where there is no feedback but there are just hidden nodes, it in itself is also growing. But let's say they have six nodes. I mean, in the brain you have many, many nodes also feeding back on itself. And I think that's, that's where it's hard to imagine where we are not getting a good grasp on, on what their mechanism really is. And I, I, so that's at least 
in the last year of my learning about this stuff, uh, where what's going on. I, I hope that helps. Uh, I, the first is, is a word of advertising. If any of you are interested in this notion of artificial intelligence, we will be having a symposium specifically on this after the main academy meeting on Wednesday and Thursday. And any of you are very welcome to stay. Um, uh, I think some of the people who will be there will defend the power of uh, neural networks, even in their current state. And I, I don't want to speak for them, but I, I was wondering whether, uh, Wolf, you slightly underestimated the self-organization of these networks. Because even if they are fit forward, in fact, they also have a feedback component because uh, feed forward, the activation is propagated, but feedback, the gradient of the error is being propagated backward and changes the system. And so it, they self-organize in a rather remarkable way, for instance, to, uh, let's say you expose them to paintings, they're able to separate the style of the painting from the content of the painting, and the style can be applied to new paintings. Uh, it's rather spectacular results. Um, and there, there are strong developments in this area also, which indeed make them more coupled to themselves. So one development is the uh, addition of an attention network, which is able to select a subpart of the input and say, this is the important part to focus on. And there is learning of this attention network itself. So that creates a loop. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second one, which I think you mentioned, is the hidden units can be self-connected. And there are learning algorithms by propagation through time that allow learning of these recurrent connections as well. So uh, the complexity even of the existing networks, I think we will agree that they are not sufficient for human cognition, but they are already very uh, self-coupled in various ways. Yeah, I, I did by no means want to play them down. Uh, the performances are fantastic, but they differ in some essential uh, aspects from, from biological systems. And there's a recent paper in Nature that came from the Google group in London who also produced the the, the system that played the goal. Um, and they have interestingly now, um, and I think you mentioned that implicitly, um, produced a parallel network, which actually is a recurrent network, a sub-network, which is external to the deep learning network system in order to capitalize on the ability of, of uh, recurrent networks to process sequences and to have fading memory and to self-organize in order to implement something that looks like an attentional mechanism in order to read out in an associative way the information from an external storage device. The problem they have with these deep learning networks is that all the changes, all the memories, they are in the connections that are also processing, um, which is very brain-like, but um, it poses a problem for these machines because if you change the coupling strength in order to accommodate uh, one pattern, uh, you have to change the coupling strength to, in order to accommodate another pattern. And these things were very soon collide um, or scale unfavorably with the number of nodes you need in order to represent uh, a lot of different items. And then there is something very <laughs> peculiar, uh, how how these machines can be misled so easily. There is a whole culture now developing of people who make fun out of uh, devising stimulus constellations that lead these systems astray. And one example is that uh, one of these pattern recognition machines that is, is used by Google for face recognition, also Facebook, um, they perform admirably well um, if everything is fine, but if you give them a picture that is overlaid with a little bit of structured, white no structured noise, which a human being would not even recognize. It looks exactly the same to you. And the machine goes completely astray, goes somewhere else. And that tells you a little bit that there must be some very basic difference in the algorithms, because after all, our brain consumes 30 watt in energy, and um, uh, these machines, usually they take the energy required for a, a small city. Um, so there are different strategies and I think it's worthwhile looking at nature uh, and evolution. Uh, it, it, it found elegant tricks early on. <coughs> we can continue our discussions over lunch, but I would like to thank both Singer and...
all the speakers of this session on biology.